Welcome and good morning to you from a very sunny Luxembourg. I hope that the weather is as nice in Ireland as it is here. Uh, I'm just sorry not to be with you back in Ireland, but the, one of the wonders of technology is that I can be present virtually to welcome you and to chair this, this discussion. Now, I'm going to describe myself as the chairman as an interested bystander because my own background is in EU law and as uh, somebody who, as Advocate General Eleanor Sharpston, spent 14 and a half years at the Court of Justice of the European Union, writing opinions on many topics, including topics involving social rights. And it's a bad admission, but during that time, very, very, very seldom did anyone even mention to me the European Charter, as distinct from the EU's own Charter of Social Rights. So this is probably a public discussion which is very much overdue. And uh, I am a bystander because I'm no longer at the court, but I'm absolutely interested. And I am looking forward to learning a great deal from having two such expert speakers discussants. Uh, we've agreed we're going to put the two interventions one directly after the other and then have a shared question and answer session in which you can put your questions to our two panelists on the basis of both their interventions. Now, my first speaker, uh, my first intervener, it's a pleasure to be able to welcome and introduce Professor Aoife Nolan, who is Professor of International Human Rights Law and co-director of the Human Rights Law Center at the University of Nottingham. Now, I think it would be fair to say I've introduced her as an academic, but in fact, she's someone whose professional experience straddles the legal policy practitioner and academic fields because she has on the one hand uh, the current role as Vice President of the Council of Europe's European Committee of Social Rights. She's very well published as an academic. She's done a work in association with the United Nations. But on the other hand, she is also an academic expert member at Doughty Street Chambers. So we have someone here who has a real wealth of both intellectual and academic experience and on the street experience that she can share with us. And Aoife, I'm looking forward very much to hearing you. Over to you. Great, thank you so much, Eleanor. Now I'm going to attempt to connect to my slides. So I apologize beforehand as I collapse the entire session, but it's lovely to be here and it's particularly lovely to be, um, ah, yes, it's particularly lovely to be sharing um, a platform and to be sharing uh, an event with uh, Olivia, who I know so well and whose work I respect so much, and of course yourself, Eleanor. Uh, and of course, the same is very true about uh, the um, enormous work that you have done, both in the area of social rights and in the area of EU law and European law more generally. I'm currently struggling to uh, find my slides, but I'm quietly confident. There we go. Um, Here we go. So I'm, deli I'm delighted to start now. And essentially, I mean, I think the aim with my comments today is to set this up as a kind of a, a, a scene setting intervention where I will outline the achievements and the challenges of the European Social Charter system at 60 before we move on to discussing some of the more, a, a more particular, uh, shall we say, specialized area focusing on the engagement between the European Social Charter system and the EU system. Um, and, in, in or, and all of this is done with a view towards or a concern about ensuring more effective protection of social rights in Europe as a whole. And so obviously, first of all, it's delightful to be here today and I'm very grateful to the organizers. Um, I just want to start um, very quick. I'm quickly by saying that I'm speaking today as vice president of the European Committee of Social Rights, but I'm not speaking on behalf of the committee. So any outrageous or provocative or 
simply completely wrong opinions expressed are very much my own and should not be attributed to the fine colleagues that I work with. And before I begin, I want to very quickly pay tribute to the work of James Kingston, um, legal advisor to the Department of Foreign Affairs, who played such an important role when it came to Ireland's work around human rights and international law generally. And I want to say that, like many others, I recognise and I'm deeply saddened by the fact that with his death, we have lost someone hugely important in this sphere. And I'm very grateful to James and the work that he did, you know, around human rights, but also international law more, er, international law more generally. But moving to the substance of today's comments, today I am going to talk about a key element of the European regional human rights system. One of the two principal human rights accountability mechanisms within the Council of Europe, namely the European Social Charter System. And this system has been in play or in existence since 1961, which of course is why we're meeting today uh, kind of 60 and a half years after the, uh, after the system, after the system uh, was initiated. Now, following uh, Russia's effective recent departure from the Council of Europe, there are 42 states parties to the European Social Charter. And of these, 35, 35 have, are parties to the 1996 revised European Social Charter, with seven remaining committed to the original charter of 1961. And given that I'm located in Ireland, I flag at the get, from the get-go that Ireland has been a state party tonight, has been a state party to the 1996 revised charter since 2000. Now, we say 60 years. However, I think it's really important to look at, you know, straight in the face and to recognize that the 1996 charter and indeed the additional protocol providing for collective complaint system, which I'm going to talk about a bit more later, um, which I'll speak more about later, both of these elements of the system came about as a result of a deliberate e effort to inject life into the European social charter system, which frankly had been regarded as largely dormant and had been ignored by key stakeholders for much of the previous 30 years. And as such, while the system has been in place for 60 years, it is really only in the last 30 that it has, I think, flourished, you know, towards its, towards its full potential. And of course, there's still an awful lot of, of ground, to, ground that we could be covering. So what are we talking about when we talk about the Charter? Um, both the 1961 and the 96 Charter, surprise, surprise, contain very detailed labour right protections, from the right to work, to trade union rights, to the, to the right to safe and healthy work conditions, to the labour rights of women and migrants, right? These are firm, you know, firm elements of both charters. And while the 61 Charter was absolutely far ahead of its time in terms of the protection that it afforded to groups like children, and disabled people, um, the much more expansive and much more up-to-date 1996 Charter includes a much wider range of such rights. For instance, Article 23 of the 1996 Charter is a groundbreaking provision globally in terms of human rights protection on the older person's rights to social protection, including the obligation to make sure that older persons can choose their lifestyle freely and live independent lives in familiar sounding, in their familiar surroundings for as long as they wish and are able to. Okay, so this was groundbreaking in 1996. And indeed, given that we still have no UN treaty on the rights of older persons, it remains, I suppose, almost the high watermark in terms of legal le enforceable legal protections on older persons' rights. We also see things like Article 31 on the right to housing. And there is one right in the Charter that is unique in international and indeed regional human rights law, Article 30 on the right to protection from poverty and social exclusion. So let me give you a very quick taster of how the 1996 Charter really gives us, reflects a more modern understanding of right holders and the challenges that they face. Article 15 of the 61 Charter sets out the rights of physically, 
note the language are mentally disabled persons to vocational training, rehabilitation and social resettlement. Okay. At the time, this was it was groundbreaking to have a rights based provision focused on disabled people, no question. However, time has passed and in 1996, we can see the charter, the revised charter, speaking about the right of persons with disabilities to independence, social integration and participation in the life of the community. So we can see through the change in Article 15, and indeed the committee's work around Article 15, how social and legal understanding of the position of people with disabilities as right holders has evolved in the 35 years between charters. And I think we should bear in mind, just remind ourselves that this is in 1996, 10 years before we have the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So again, very much a groundbreaking provision. Now, I'm conscious that there may be people sitting at home going, two sets of standards, one system, and feeling a rising sense of panic, okay? How can you possibly, within that, within that system, ensure consistent treatment of states? Now, first of all, I, I, I can reassure, however, on the, on the first point, that the committee has, in fact, significantly mitigated the dangers of different systems of protection for right holders, depending on which charter the state party they're based in has ratified, okay? This is obviously something the committee has been aware of. There is the backdrop of the differing mandates in the two charters, though they don't differ enormously, in fact, if you kind of dig down into it, but there is a very strong sense that you would, there was a, there was a risk, depending on the committee's approach, of a gap, in, a gap between the protection one received under, say, the 1961 Charter and the 1996 Charter. And so how the committee has done this, how it's avoided this kind of parallel or divergent systems of protection is by carefully identifying areas of overlap of rights, overlap between the rights in the different charters and the provisions in the different charters to ensure a uniformity of approach where this is possible and appropriate. And sometimes it just won't be, right? An example of this, just to give a sense of it, is the right to housing, right? Now, aspects of the right to housing are protected under Article 16 on the right to social, legal, and economic protection of the family, right? And a version of that right is under both the 61 and the 96 Charter. However, aspects of the right to housing are obviously also protected under Article 31 of the revised Charter on the right to housing. Okay, so how do you deal with this? And what we see in a number of different complaints is that the committee has stressed that Article 16 and Article 31 are not identical, they're not interchangeable, but that they partially overlap in the sense that the notion of adequate housing and the notion of forced eviction, which are issues the committee looks at, are identical under both Articles 16 and 31. Okay, so where there's overlap, the committee has identified it to reinforce a coherent, unified system of social rights protection, whether it's the social, the 61 or the 96 charter we're talking about. Now, the other thing you'll be aware of, some of you in the audience anyway, is that the char social charter system is unusual in that unlike, say, the ECHR, or unlike the UN Human Rights Treaties, it provides for an a la carte system of ratification. Okay, so a la carte, lovely, like a menu where you pick and choose. However, it has to be said that here your choices are limited, right? In order to be bound by either the 61 or the 96 instrument, the state must accept a minimum number and range of provisions of, of part two of the respective charters. And that's dealt with under the articles in the slide in front of you. And of course, but, but having done the minimum, it's then up to states to decide which other provisions of either charter it wishes to be bound by. Okay, so obviously the risk of this is that states end up doing the absolute minimum. However, what's interesting, certainly I think it's very interesting and very positive from a social rights protection perspective is that this is very definitely not what has happened in practice. And with a few notable exceptions of states like Croatia, Hungary, Azerbaijan, Albania and Armenia, states have generally accepted a very high number of provisions 
Ireland, for instance, has accepted 92 out of 98 elements of the 1996 Charter. It didn't have to, it chose to. Okay, and that is even the high watermark for acceptance by any means. When we look, for instance, at you know other Western European counterparts, Spain and France have both ex have both accepted the revised charter in its entirety. It's accepted; they've accepted all the provisions, all the elements of the charter. While Italy and Greece, in turn, have both accepted more elements than Ireland. Okay, and I say this not in any way to be negative about Ireland, which has demonstrated very strong commitment to the charter system, but to flag that even though there was this risk of a minimalist or a patchwork approach, that's very much not what we've seen in in practice. Okay, but I, you know, enough of the technical. Just before, um, enough of the kind of the technicalities of it. The, I want to just very quickly highlight some of the important bodies that are involved in the system. And the first is, um, the first is, the first is obviously the European Committee of Social Rights, which is a body of independent experts. And we are elected to the committee and we do terms of six years each. And there's a cap. You can only do two terms, which means you've an, you've a, you, you do have a healthy turnover in terms of personnel and range of experiences on the charter, okay? We have a reporting system under the charter in which the committee annually makes, we make a series of findings of conformity or non-conformity in, in terms of states efforts to give effect to the charter. We look at national situations, excuse me, we look at state reports, we look at information we have from other sources, for instance, NGOs, trade unions, NHRIs, and we make a series of findings of non-conformity or conformity. And to give you a sense of the scope of that work, since 1969, when we started, oh my goodness, I just need to plug in my computer. I might let you do that, Michael, if you don't mind. Uh, the committee has adopted, um, the committee has adopted around 25,000 conclusions. Okay, so there is a big body of work out there. And these are soft law findings of conformity or non-conformity. They're like the concluding observations of UN treaty bodies. And states are expected to comply with them as part of the good faith, their good faith, ob good faith commitment to their international uh, law obligations. And I think it's worth noting that in the last, uh, certainly the last 10 years in particular, we've seen a real increase in the use of these conclusions by civil society and trade unions at the domestic level for advocacy purposes, including in Ireland. Okay, and that is something that we've seen in the last decade when we did not see a CSA before. In addition to the reporting process, we also have a collective complaints process in terms of that 16 states have agreed to be banned by. Now note, 16, it's not a huge number, but that, and I'll come back to that point. And Ireland is one of those states. And since the entry into force of the uh, additional protocol that provides for that complaints mechanism, we have, uh, we've reached a hunt, we've made over 170 decisions brought by trade unions, international trade unions, employer organizations, international NGOs, international employer organizations, and we've 39 complaints pending. And it's really important to flag this. It is not an individual complaints mechanism in the sense of the European Court of Human Rights one, okay, or the UN ones. It is focused at engaging with deliberately systemic problems that arise in national situations. You don't get a remedy as an individual. You don't get the, and, and also it has become clear that the committee cannot award compensation either. So it's not, it's a very different system to many of the other international and regional complaints mechanisms. There are two other bodies that I need to flag, um, and I have very limited time, but I just want to mention them. that while the committee, in a, the key thing is that the committee is the body that assesses from a legal standpoint, the compliance of state's law and practice with the charter, right? That is our job. We do the legal assessment. However, we also have the governmental committee, uh, which is made up of state representatives assisted by others, which considers conclusions of non-conformity that we adopt as part of our reporting process. And they make recommendations. Um, they engage with the committee of ministers and they put together um, 
they, for instance, put together a resolution suggesting that there would be a focus on particular elements or particular issues by the Committee of Ministers following the reporting cycle. I'm brutally shortening that, but I'm not going to focus on it, and I don't think we need enormous detail on it here. A body that I think that I will refer back to is a Committee of Ministers, and the Committee of Ministers obviously has a very significant role in the ECHR system, being very much responsible with, around, say, implementation and follow-up, and certainly we are, we benefit as a committee from having the Committee of Ministers doing follow-up on our reporting systems. However, they do not do the same. They do not do the same uh, on our collective complaints. They will make a recommendation often, and, a, and in fact, in the last few years, they do it almost as a matter of, of course. They make a recommendation to states parties following our complaints, but they don't actually, they're not involved in monitoring or checking whether states have done the necessary uh, in order to come into conformity um, with, with the charter. Okay, so I mentioned this because it's important to note that there is this complexity of system. There's lots of, there are different actors at play. The committee is the key player, but there is potential for other bodies to be involved. There are bodies involved in the system that could take on aspects of the committee's work, particularly around perhaps follow-up and implementation. In terms of what we've looked at, very wide ranging. I mean, I'm just pulling on the screen in front of you, you can see a few, Transgender Europe with um, an ILGA against the Czech Republic, which is about um, requiring a, a force, effectively forced sterilization in order to change your legal gender identity. Eurocop in Ireland, which is about trade union rights of Gardaí. Um, Ica Atem in Greece about social security, uh, social security, um, social security rights of young workers in Greece. Uve in Ireland about the gender pay gap. Marangopoulos, which was about environmental rights, a case about the environmental impacts of lignite mining. And housing rights, a very significant decision with regards to social housing and the decision of um, FIDH and Ireland. So, so, that, so we've, we've covered an awful lot of thematic areas. The other thing, of course, is that we've done a lot of work around group specific groups. So, for instance, we've looked at groups whose social rights are under particular pressure in Europe, children, particularly, for instance, um, uh, children, children, people with disabilities. Migrant and asylum seeker rights has been an increasing area over the last 15 years, especially. Okay, and we've handed down a series of decisions, including some very far reaching ones on the rights of unaccompanied and other migrant and asylum seeking children. Okay, we've looked at older persons rights, and we've looked at Roma rights extensively. Okay, and I'm flagging this because I think it's important to note for those of us who are interested in human rights, whether in Europe or more broadly, that at times, the committee has gone significantly beyond the different UN treaty bodies in terms of the rights protection the Charter has been deemed to afford to protect these groups, okay? Our work on disability rights is significantly more, I would say, uh, uh, we have certainly done more on disabled people's rights in a more wide-ranging way than, say, the European Court of Human Rights. Um, our stuff on physical punishment, uh, our, 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 our decisions on physical punishment saying that all physical punishment against children went beyond what the Committee on the Rights of the Child was saying at the time of our decision. Okay, so we have, we've been, we've been prepared to push ahead in areas that are significant. And part of the reason for this, there's a number of reasons for this, okay? First of all, we have a very wide ranging mandate. Okay, we have, and the, so that's very important. We have a very wide ranging mandate. Interestingly, parts of the social charter very clearly have implications, even though it's a social rights instrument, for civil and political rights. For instance, parts of Article 17 talk about, you know, protection and care of children, which are traditionally understood to be civil and political rights issues. The other thing is, as I've said, we look at systemic issues rather than individual complaints. So that gives us an opportunity to engage with the broader context in a way that can be difficult for people, for bodies that have to look through an individual, indiv the lens of an individual claim. And finally, I think we have certainly when compared to the UN committees, we have a significant advantage 
in that we're focused on a region with a high level of homogeneity in terms of living standards and cultural heritage, right? And I stress that not because that makes Europe better, simply that it makes our job easier because we don't have to take into account the diversity of standards and practice that the UN treaty bodies do when they're doing their work, okay? And we're certainly very aware of what international bodies are doing, other international and regional bodies are doing. We've said very clearly, and um, you can see it on the slides in front of you, our, the charter must be interpreted in line with the Vienna Convention and the Law of Treaties. And as far as possible, it needs to be interpreted in, in harmony with other rules of international law. It's a living instrument. It has to be interpreted in light of developments on the national law of member states at the Council of Europe as well as relevant international instruments. And we certainly have paid attention to a very significant amount of sources, particularly European sources. I'm not going to talk about this because I think Olivier will. EU sources, Council of Europe sources, UN treaty bodies, et cetera. But I do want to say that even though we engage with these sources, we are, our work is very much informed by these other sources, right? We don't follow other, we don't follow other international bodies, we do not apply the mandate of other bodies or subordinate our mandate to theirs. Okay, we're very conscious of that. And so an example of where we, we have looked is, for instance, where we've looked at the CRPD, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which has very much influenced our approach. Now, I want to very quickly flag, again, I think it's a springboard for Olivier's comments, and I apologize, Olivier, if it's not in fact a springboard, but I want to flag that there have been times when we've also been clear when we won't draw on sources, okay? So for instance, we have been very clear that we will not, there is not an automatic presumption that uh, legal texts of the European Union are in conformity with the European Social Charter. Okay, that's a very significant, that's a different approach to the European Court of Human Rights when it comes to the, to the, to the legal text of the European Union. And it was a very significant statement um, in this decision of CGT and France. Okay, and I'll, I don't want to speak too much about it because I do think Olivier will be speaking about this. And then we have a later decision on Greece, which involved, um, where, where, which focused on restrictions on charter rights, which resulted from the Greek government's other international obligations, essentially obligations that derive from the financial support mechanism agreed between the Greek government and, and what's known as the Troika in 2010. So EU institutions in the IMF and the ECB. And here we explicitly stated that the fact that contested provisions of domestic law seek to fulfill the requirements of other legal obligations doesn't remove them from the ambit of the charter, right? So I leave it here, but just to flag that. So just because states are trying to do the right thing in terms of their other international legal obligations, including EU ones, doesn't mean that they're okay from a charter perspective or immune to scrutiny from a charter perspective. Okay, so that's the good stuff, okay? There are significant challenges and I want to finish by talking about some of these. First of all, there's the issue of political commitment. There is an ongoing failure of states to embrace, fully embrace the system. And this is made clearest by the fact that the fact that only 16 states have signed up to the collective complaints mechanism and seven states still are remain only remain remain parties to only the 1961 the narrower original charter and so as it remains we can see a difference and certainly see a strong difference in commitment between state commitment within the council of europe to the echr and the basic texts and elements of the european social charter system the second thing that I think it's very important to, to mention is that of low profile. While the profile of the Charter has massively increased in the last 15 years, uh, this has been from a very, very low base. It remains very much, you know, we talk about it being the sister instrument of the ECHR. The fact is it remains at best a very distant cousin that barely is invited to family weddings, right? That's improving. But certainly it's, it's at the, the table that is furthest away from the bride and groom with the family wedding at the moment, I, I would say. Olivier will speak about the extent to which social rights are marginalized within the EU legal framework. However, social rights, it's important to acknowledge, are still not always accepted as an integral element of human rights within the Council of Europe itself. I think it's quite significant. They have their own section on the webpage. There's human rights and then there's ensuring social rights, which is definitely reflective 
has, you know, is to some degree reflective of a perception of those rights. That said, we're seeing really significant shifts. The current Council of Europe Commissioner for Human Rights is huge, has strongly engaged with social rights in the Charter, putting them at the absolute centre of her work, particularly around COVID. Um, and ironically, the disaster of the financial and economic crisis has been good news in terms of the profile um, of social rights by making clear the precarity of social rights enjoyment and the importance of social rights in systems where really I think their enjoyment had largely been assumed until that point. And with each of these crises, we are seeing the importance of social rights becoming more evident and then becoming more present in domestic and international legal, social and media discourse and political discourse, both within the Council of Europe and in Europe more generally. However, the fact is that low profile remains. Some of that's attributable to the fact that government departments that historically engage with the social charter, labor and protection, are not those that deal with human rights issues, okay? which tend to be say foreign affairs and justice. And in some instances, that isn't true of all countries, but it is true of some. And in some instances, this may impact on the extent to which state reports and state responses to reports reflect understanding of the scope and content of the human rights outlined in the charter, okay? And I think that, that you know, that's, worth, that's worth noting because it's about the, the way in which the system works in practice, who is doing what. And it's not just governments who aren't familiar with social rights. The low level of knowledge of the system also manifests in low levels of awareness of the system on the part of civil society and NHRIs. And it's worth noting, and I say this as a legal academic, it's worth noting that at least part of this is due to the fact that the charter system is not routinely taught or even addressed as part of international human rights law or European human rights courses. Okay. And this directly impacts on the ability and therefore the willingness of lawyers and others working in the human rights field to engage, engage with or to consider the social charter system. Okay, And certainly I think that may be an element in the EU context too from conversations I've had from people working in as lawyers within the EU, but I'll leave that to Olivier who may agree or disagree. And of course the lack of legal familiarity also impacts on the the attention paid to the charter at the national level as well, okay? And while in some jurisdictions like Italy and France, we see domestic courts directly engaging extensively with the charter, that certainly isn't in the case in others. For instance, Ireland, the UK, where you simply don't see reference to the social charter in any meaningful way. Moving beyond the issue of profile, there are also very serious logistical and operational challenges. The committee is a part-time unpaid body whose work is increasing and has steadily increased over time with a secretariat that works incredibly hard, is incredibly proficient, but is both understaffed and underfunded, okay? And in the last two years, there have been multiple efforts to look at different aspects of the committee's work. Absolutely, you know, a, a good faith effort to improve social rights protection and the workings of the social charter system. And the most recent of these is part of an ongoing review by the Committee of Ministers Ad Hoc Working Group, GT Shock, which is trying to focus in particular on the reporting system, which has become very complex following the introduction of a simplified process for those states that have accepted the collective complaints mechanism. So you now have two reporting systems. The timelines are complicated. It's not, it, it's frequently very difficult for states to know what they're doing. And indeed, there have been other reviews too, one done by a group of social rights experts which Olivier led, and significantly in April 2021, a series of proposals from the Secretary General. Whatever the recommendations that come from the ongoing process, and there will be recommendations, it is crucial that they should be based on a clear understanding of how the committee and the reporting and collective complaints process work in practice. And there has to be a clear quantification of the potential implications of any recommendations in terms of the working methods of a hard press committee and the resources of a secretariat with an already highly pressurized staff and budget. Okay, that's just the simple nature of it, right? There are overburdened regional human rights systems across, across different parts of the globe. It is very important that the social charter does not become one because it will directly undermine social rights protection in Europe. And this isn't a suggestion on my part that there isn't a need for change. There clearly is. 
but it's simply an effort to flag some of the factors that should be taken into account when thinking about what changes should be made, okay? It's, there's no point having a utopian system that isn't adequately resourced or isn't going to work in practice. And I know that this is a huge concern for Jake Deschamps and others involved. The final issue I want to flag is that of non-implementation and follow-up. As I mentioned earlier, we've loads of decisions. We've lots of conclusions. However, in contrast to the ECHR system, we're responsible for, for tracking follow-up with our collective complaints decisions. It's a huge burden. And truthfully, we don't feel we're doing it as well as we, as we can be, given the other work that we need to do and the time the proper follow-up takes. And it's, it would be, certainly there's been discussions and it would clearly be desirable if the Committee of Ministers were to adopt a more uh, significant role in this, in this process. And the trouble, the other problem we have with non-implementation follow-up and is a linked issue of non-implementation. We have had a series of repeat complaints. Right? looking at almost identical issues in the same countries because earlier decisions have not been implemented, right? And this obviously is problematic. It undermines the collective complaint system, right? But most, much more importantly, it leaves those whose social rights are not being secured in those countries in the lurch. Okay, so this issue of non-implementation, which also ties in with the political commitment issue I've highlighted at the beginning, is absolutely fundamental when we're talking about improving social rights protection in Europe. So I'll leave it there. There's a lot to be done, but there's obviously a lot has been done, but there's an awful lot left to be done in terms of making social rights real in Europe, particularly post-COVID, as we enter, as the system enters its seventh decade. And I think the challenge now, the, the overall umbrella challenge, is for all those involved in the system, states, the Committee of Ministers, other Council of Europe bodies, civil society, NHRIs, and of course, the committee ourselves, is to work together constructively to ensure that social rights are at the heart of European law and policy making. Okay, and I think that's a good point at which to hand over to Olivier. Thank you. Aoife, thank you very much indeed for mastering the various challenges of technology with such panache, with such panache, which I'm extremely grateful and for a very informative and very thought-provoking uh, first intervention. I have to say, listening to you as someone who is a recently elected member of the Aarhus Convention Compliance Committee, I am overwhelmingly struck by just how many similarities there are between your description of your committee and what I would be saying about the committee on which I now serve uh, and phrases that, that were really resonating with me. You know, we're a part-time unpaid committee with an increasing workload and a dedicated but under-resourced secretariat. That sounds desperately familiar. It really does. Uh, I have been asked to remind everyone, just before I turn to Professor Olivia de Schutter, uh, I have been asked to remind everyone that the right place for the questions, which I hope are accumulating in your minds and which you're busy formulating even now, the right place for questions to both our panelists is in the Q&A section, uh, which there's a little button at the bottom of your screen. You'll see Mark Q&A, Q&A, uh, please, for questions, which I will then attempt to moderate in some halfway intelligent way and put to our two panelists after we've heard from Olivier. So Olivier, may I turn to you please? Uh, and I mean, obviously uh, you are the perfect matching speaker to Eva in the sense that you too have an enormously distinguished and important and involved career in this area. Uh, you're a professor at uh, Louvain and SIPO. Uh, you've been you know, the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. Uh, you've been a member of various very relevant UN committees. You chaired the EU Network of Independent Experts on Fundamental Rights. And of course, you produced a, an extremely thoughtful report for the European Parliament in 2016, which is referenced in the publicity for this, for this webinar. So without more ado, may I please invite you to take the floor. 
Many thanks indeed, um, Eleanor, for this very generous introduction. And let me first express my, my gratitude to um, Galway University for organizing this webinar and express my thanks to Aoife Nolan. There could be, of course, no better guide through this very strange beast, uh, the European Social Charter, than than Aoife, and I very much enjoyed uh, the uh, background that she sketched uh, uh, with uh, uh, great expertise and, um, and I think provides a very good starting uh, uh, ground for our discussion. Um, in, in agreement with Aoife, my remarks would be focused on the relationship between the European Social Charter and the EU legal order. And the reason for that focus is because interactions between the two systems have been increasingly frequent in recent years and um, I believe uh, call for greater attention given that um, the um, coordination is very weak between the two systems that may lead to certain new challenges ahead. Let me start by noting the two reasons why these interactions are becoming more frequent. And the first, obviously, is that EU law has increasingly grown in the very areas that are covered by the European Social Charter, employment, um, social protection in particular. Now, that is due, of course, to the expansion of the competences of the EU since the Single European Act in particular in 1987, uh, but also following the um, social protocol adopted uh, together with the Maastricht Treaty in 1992 and, and further or later incorporated in the, in the EU Treaty in um, 1997. Um, so expansion of EU's competences in areas covered by the um, social rights listed in the European Social Charter. In addition, um, increasingly the economic freedoms protected under the EU treaties, particularly the freedom to provide um, services across borders, freedom of establishment, have been um, questioning state policies that seek to protect social rights and sometimes require a sort of balancing act between um, social rights on the one hand and economic freedoms on the other hand. This is illustrated, for example, by the the Kohl and Decker judgments of um, 28th of April um, 1998 of the Court of Justice of the, of the EU, or by the Laval and, and Viking cases of December 2007 uh, concerning the rights to collective action um, versus respectively uh, freedom of establishment and freedom to provide services. So we have these um, tensions that are growing between economic freedoms and, and social rights in such, in such cases. A second reason why these interactions be between the two legal systems become more frequent is because the European Social Charter in its successive revisions, and I'm very grateful again to Ethan Olin for having uh, so clearly outlined those developments, these successive revisions have led the European Social Charter to incorporate a number of guarantees that actually are borrowed from either primary or more frequently secondary EU legislation. Um, whether we consider the 1988 um, protocol that has added four additional substantive rights uh, to the list of rights of the original 1961 European Social Charter, or whether we consider the 1996 revised European Social Charter, a number of provisions of which were borrowed from EU law, for example, in areas such as um, equality of treatment or health and safety at work or, collect or collective bargaining. So we have um, uh, these interactions that are becoming more frequent. And at the same time, we have on the side of the EU um, the adoption of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights in uh, 2000, when it was initially um, proclaimed um, and, and then later, of course, incorporated in the treaties, um, that builds to a certain extent on the European Social Charter um, from which it seeks inspiration. So 
we have these developments, both on the side of the European Social Charter and on the side of EU law, that lead to more frequent interactions and, and overlaps between uh, the two systems. But there is no coordination um, uh, between EU law, including the Charter of Fundamental Rights on the one hand, and the Council of Europe, um, European Social Charter on the other hand. Um, in fact, things are even worse than a lack of coordination. Um, one might say that there has been a relatively selective reference to the European Social Charter in um, EU law. And I would like to illustrate this by um, four examples of this selectivity of the EU towards the European Social Charter of the Council of Europe. The first example, the most striking in my, in my view, is that when the Charter of Fundamental Rights was um, discussed in 1999-2000, there were, of course, references to the European Social Charter, but um, a few rights of the European Social Charter were not considered for inclusion, including most strikingly the right to work of Article 1, Paragraph 1 of the European Social Charter that is not as such part of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the EU, but more importantly, perhaps, the Charter of Fundamental Rights that was adopted in 2000 does not refer to any duty for EU institutions to read the social provisions of the Charter of Fundamental Rights in line with the interpretation given within the Council of Europe of the European Social Charter. Now, this is in sharp contrast with the fate of the European Convention on Human Rights in the Charter of Fundamental Rights. There is in Article 52, Paragraph 3 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights an explicit reference to the European Convention on Human Rights, and there is an explicit duty imposed on institutions to read the rights and freedoms of the Charter of Fundamental Rights that correspond to rights and freedoms listed in the European Convention on Human Rights in accordance with the interpretation given of the European Convention on Human Rights by the European Court of Human Rights. There is nothing of that sort uh, concerning the European Social Charter. So that even the social provisions of the Charter of Fundamental Rights that are inspired by the European Social Charter do not have to be aligned in the way they shall be interpreted with the um, uh, jurisprudence of the European Committee of Social Rights. Um, moreover, when the Charter of Fundamental Rights was incorporated in uh, the EU treaties uh, with the Treaty of Lisbon, um, as we know, there were some, some formal adaptations of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, including um, an explicit reference in Article 52, Paragraph 5 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights to a distinction that should be made between social rights per se, or strictly speaking, um, on the one hand, and on the other hand, social principles um, that only enjoy what is referred to, and this is a bit of a jargon, uh, but only enjoy a form of normative justiciability. In other terms, the principles um, included amongst the social provisions of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the EU can only be invoked in uh, judicial um, uh, settings in combination with um, provisions of EU law or domestic law that either implement the principle in question or derogate from that um, social principle. In other terms, those principles are not self-standing um, rights. Uh, they are not um, social rights in the full meaning of the expression that can be invoked um, in, um, um, in uh, judicial context. So um, that is one first um, example of this selectivity vis-a-vis -vis the European Social Charter. It concerns how the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the EU was, was framed and is now uh, to be interpreted. The second example is that since 2002 and more systematically since 2005, legislative proposals of the European Commission are accompanied by impact assessments that um, 
examine the economic, um, social, and environmental impacts of the legislation proposed for adoption by the European Parliament and, and the, um, uh, the Council of the EU. But those impact assessments do not refer systematically to the European Social Charter, although they refer systematically to the Charter of Fundamental Rights, including the reference to the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, so that is a second example of how the European Social Charter was relatively marginalized in the lawmaking process of the EU. The third example, and I say this with, of course, great respect for the work of the Court of Justice of the EU, but the Court of Justice has not been um, willing until now to incorporate the European Social Charter as um, um, an authoritative source on which to develop fundamental rights as part of the general principles of EU law, as the Court of Justice is encouraged to do under Article 6, Paragraph 3 of the EU Treaty, despite the fact that the European Social Charter has been ratified by all 27 um, EU member states, um, and despite the fact that other international human rights treaties, the European Convention on Human Rights, but also the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, or indeed the Convention on the Rights of the Child, have benefited from such systematic referencing by the Court of Justice of the EU. Now, the reason for this is probably twofold. First of all, many of the rights listed in the European Social Charter are considered to require from um, um, states or um, uh, the EU, uh, whatever uh, may be the case, that they take action. And so probably the fear of the Court of Justice is that by incorporating social rights of the European Social Charter amongst general principles of EU law, it would be questioning the um, allocation of competences across the EU member states and the, and the EU itself. I think this is um, not correct because social rights also require negative obligations to be complied with um, 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 from the addressees. But the second reason may be simply that the levels of commitment of the EU member states vis-a-vis -vis European Social Charter are quite um, variable and disparate um, in this a la carte system that Yves Nolan uh, described. So that's a third example of this selective use or referencing to the European Social Charter by the, by the EU. The fourth example is that um, when the European Pillar of Social Rights was adopted at the Göteborg Social Summit um, of November 2017, and then later this was endorsed by the European Council, the European Pillar of Social Rights was of course an important moment. It basically sought to improve the standing of social rights in the EU legal order. More precisely, it sought to achieve a better balance within the European semester process between, on the one hand, the budgetary disciplines and uh, the, 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 the fight against macroeconomic imbalances um, in the European semester process, and on the other hand, the need for greater social convergence across the 27 EU member states in order to ensure that the member states will not be tempted to improve their competitiveness on the internal market at the cost of social rights. So in that sense, the European Pillar of Social Rights was extremely um, important. It was also important because um, quite apart from this rebalancing between the economic and, and the social in the European semester process, it was the springboard for legislative action proposed by the European Commission um, following the precedent of the Community Charter of Fundamental um, Social Rights of Workers of 1989. Um, and that is illustrated by the adoption of the action plan on the implementation of the European Pillar of Social Rights uh, adopted uh, by the European Commission on 4th of March 2021 and then endorsed at the at the Lisbon European Council um, in May 2021. So the European Pillar of Social Rights was an important attempt to enhance the visibility of um, 
social convergence in the context of um, the Economic and Monetary Union. And of course, I and many others have welcomed the European Pillar of Social Rights as an important contribution to strengthening references to social rights in EU law and policy making. However, however, the European Pillar of Social Rights is not a catalog of rights that can be invoked in judicial proceedings. It is not a substitute for either um, a revised version of the Charter of Fundamental Rights that might be better aligned with the full range of provisions of the European Social Charter, nor is it um, um, a substitute for a reference that could be made um, more systematically to the case law developed by the European Committee of Social Rights. So that is the context, right? We have more and more overlaps between the two, um, more and more um, um, interactions between the two legal systems, but a selective approach to the European Social Charter that does not benefit by far from the same kind of visibility um, than the European Convention on Human Rights benefits from in the EU legal order. Now, is this a problem? Well, I would argue it is for two reasons. First of all, because there's a risk of conflicts between EU law and policy making on the one hand and the European Social Charter. Now, the risk of conflicts emerges in two instances. First of all, we can have situations in which the EU member states are imposed conflicting obligations on the respectively EU law and the European Social Charter. Let me take one well-known example. In 2007, on 18th of December 2007, when the Court of Justice of the EU adopted its, its uh, judgment in the case of Laval, um, the Court of Justice basically concluded that the freedom to provide services under what was then Article 49 of the EC Treaty um, um, could not be um, restricted uh, or, or disproportionately by um, uh, the collective action of Swedish unions who were trying to force a Latvian company providing services um, in, uh, in Sweden um, uh, to force that company to negotiate on a case by case um, basis rates of pay and to conclude a collective agreement under Swedish um, uh, law in the, in the construction sector, right? The, 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 that's a very um, superficial summary of that case, but it's a well-known case uh, that I can therefore uh, spare uh, a more detailed description of. Now, following that judgment of December, 2007, Sweden changed its labor legislation and it restricted um, basically the, the collective bargaining rights of Swedish unions, leading then the European Committee of Social Rights in 2013 at the request of Swedish unions to conclude that the changes that were made to Swedish legislation were incompatible with the duty of Sweden to promote collective bargaining under Article 6, Paragraph 2 of the European Social Charter. And by the way, the ILO, uh, the ILO's committee of experts on the application of conventions and recommendations arrived at the same conclusion. Um, now, this position of the European Committee of Social Rights was a result of what Ethan Nolan described, which is uh, an unwillingness of the European Committee of Social Rights to accept a presumption according to which when an EU member state implements EU law, it is presumed to act in compliance um, with the European Social Charter. The European Committee of Social Rights refuses to establish such a presumption as uh, the European Court of Human Rights does vis-a-vis -vis the European Convention on Human Rights since the famous case of Bosphorus Hava versus Ireland, uh, the judgment of 30th of June, 2005 of the European Court of Human Rights. The difference of approach between the European Court of Human Rights with Bosphorus Hava in 2005 on the one hand, and the European Committee of Social Rights uh, in the case cited by Ethan Nolan, CGT versus France in 2009 on the other hand, 
is because the European Social Charter does not have the same um, um, standing in EU law as the European Convention on Human Rights has. And so um, that is why the European Committee of Social Rights considers that even though a state faithfully implements EU law, that does not mean that it can be presumed to act in compliance with uh, the requirements of European um, uh, Social Charter. So th that was the Laval saga. And of course, to a certain extent, the conflict was addressed by the revision of the Posted Workers Directive in 2018. I'm not entering into those details here. But the fact is, this is a state, Sweden, that was caught between conflicting international obligations. And the second instance of conflict is within the European semester process um, launched in 2012, or um, when memoranda of understanding are negotiated between, on the one hand, um, the European Commission and the European Stability Mechanism, and on the other hand, an EU member state benefiting from some financial support from the European uh, Stability Mechanism. Um, in those cases, EU member states may be forced to adopt certain economic reforms or encouraged to adopt such, such economic reforms that would be not compatible with the requirements of the European Social Charter. And this is what happened to Greece, right? Remember the three bailouts that Greece benefited from in the years 2012, 2015. This led to no fewer than seven decisions by the European Committee of Social Rights, finding that Greece had adopted certain reforms in areas such as the levels of pensions or um, apprenticeship contracts for young workers that were inconsistent with the obligations of Greece under the um, European Social Charter. And one of those cases was the um, ICA etam um, versus Greece um, collective complaint uh, that Aoife Nolan referred to. So these are instances where member states are facing conflicting uh, expectations within the respective um, uh, systems, the EU on the one hand and the European Social Charter on the other hand. The second risk beyond the risk of conflicts is quite simply that uniform application of EU law will be made more or is made more difficult in a context in which EU member states commitments under the European Social Charter are highly variable. Not all have ratified the 1996 revised European Social Charter. Um, the range of paragraphs or provisions of the European Social Charter accepted by the EU member states uh, is different from country to country. This is the a la carte system, the patchwork that Eve Nolan was describing. And not all EU member states, moreover, have accepted the collective complaints um, protocol uh, that entered into force in 1998. So as a result, the implementation of EU legislation in areas covered by the European Social Charter may or may not be limited by the requirements imposed by the European Social Charter, leading to an imbalance between states. Um, some states will be um, limited in the flexibilities they have to implement EU law in a particular way. Other states will not face similar limitations. Um, and this was very striking in areas such as, for example, the, the implementation of the working time directive. So I, I believe, we believe, many believe that um, the situation is one that is not sustainable. Which solutions could be explored? How to improve coordination between the system, the systems? Well, first of all, immediately in the short term, the European Social Charter could be included as part of the impact assessments accompanying legislative proposals put forward by the European Commission. And it could be systematically referred to in the compatibility checks um, through which um, the European Commission verifies compatibility of its legislative proposals with the requirements of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. I think that could be done immediately and it would be in line with the memorandum of understanding that was concluded between the Council of Europe and the EU in 2007, 
at, as a follow-up to the Warsaw summit of the um, Council of Europe, and at a time when the Fundamental Rights Agency of the EU was being established, the Council of Europe and the EU negotiated this memorandum of understanding that commits the EU not only to base its work in the area of fundamental rights on the existing standards of the Council of Europe, but also to build on the findings and recommendations of the Council of Europe's monitoring bodies in order to align its work in the area of fundamental rights with that of the Council of Europe. This 2007 memorandum of understanding would require, in my view, that systematically the jurisprudence of the European Committee of Social Rights be referred to by the EU institutions whenever they operate um, in the um, social rights field. And of course, in the longer term, in the longer run, we should um, open a discussion that I believe is urgent on the accession of the EU to the European Social Charter. Now, this is not a new idea. It was presented you know, 45 years ago, 47 years ago, to be precise, when the Spinelli Treaty on the European Union was symbolically voted by the European Parliament. It was already in there, this proposal. Since then, there have been many resolutions of the European Parliament in favor of such an accession of the EU to the European Social Charter. There is a legal basis for this in Article 216 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the EU. And indeed, it would be no more difficult for the EU to accede to the European Social Charter than it has been for the EU to accede to the to the um, United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which it did in 2009. Um, in fact, the opinion 2 slash 13 that was adopted by the Court of Justice of the EU on, on 18th of December 2014 on the accession of the EU to the European Convention on Human Rights um, raises certain objections to that accession to the ECHR that are largely irrelevant to the accession of the EU to the European Social Charter, in, in, in part because the supervisory mechanism under the European Social Charter is very different than the supervisory mechanism of an international court, such as the European um, Court of Human Rights. So in other terms, I believe the objections of the um, Court of Justice of the EU to the accession of the EU to the ECHR um, are not objections that um, should delay accession to the European Social Charter. And it is, um, I think, one of the conclusions that we arrived at in this study that, um, Eleanor, you referred to, presented to the European Parliament in 2016. So these are my, um, my, my thoughts uh, concerning the relationship between the European Social Charter and um, uh, and the, uh, the EU legal order. Um, uh, really what I said is nothing more than a, than a footnote to what Eva Nolan um, uh, presented. And we look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Olivier, thank you very much for your presentation, which I, I don't think I'm going to let you describe it as a footnote to what Eva said earlier. Or if so, it was a footnote, which was one of the longest footnotes in recorded history, and also one which has to be read by those reading the main text. You know, many footnotes you just skip over, but this one emphatically was not a footnote. Um, before, I, before I open up the, the discussion, I, wanted, I wondered if I could just make one comment as a former member of the court because you make the point, why doesn't the court refer systematically to the European Social Charter the way it refers to the ECHR and so on? My first point would simply be, actually, people pleading cases before us do not systematically reference the European Social Charter. That's a very blunt thing for me to say, and it's a rather shocking thing for me to say, but if I cast my mind back to cases where it might have been helpful and relevant for the European Social Charter to have been referenced expressly by those pleading the cases in their written observations or at the hearing, the simple and brutal fact is they don't tend to do that. And the courts has itself had a great tendency now that the European, the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights has become primary law rather than soft law 
by its elevation to treaty status, the court has made a big shift across to referencing essentially what it regards as the EU's own constitutional document in preference to referencing many other things, including the ECHR. And I think there is perhaps a, a second point, I'll, I'll confine myself to the two points on this, a second point that could be made here. Uh, in the past, the a la carte nature of member st states accepting commitments under the European Social Charter has been expressly identified by a very well-known and respected Advocate General, Advocate General Jacobs in the Albany case, as being the reason why you do not regard the norms of the European Social Charter uh, as being law common to the constitutional traditions of the member states, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, now, there is a way around that. I was listening with very great interest to Aoife when she told us in her presentation how high, in fact, despite this theoretical possibility of limited minimalist patchwork acceptance, how high, in fact, is the acceptance of very large amounts of what is in the European Social Charter. And this is a really practical statement suggestion, maybe a more of a suggestion, really. If a case involves a right where, when you check, you observe that all 27 EU member states have, in fact, accepted that right, at that moment, the a la carte point is a dead point. It doesn't matter because everyone a la carte has decided to opt into this particular right. And personally, this is the ex-advocate general barrister academic speaking. I would jump on that and I would emphasize that the right in question was a right that was in the ESC. And I would stuff that into the argument as an important extra element. But uh, I, think, I think it actually has to be done actively. The court is not going of its own motion to go away and comb through the ESC and comb through what the various member states have done in order to see whether a particular right is a shared right, because the court does not have the time or the resources or the inclination to do that. Now, that was more than enough for me in the chair. Forgive me if I that was abusing my position, but I also wanted to give people a chance to put things into the Q&A. Uh, we have, in fact, already a, a question that's been there for a little while from Michael Farrell, who says, could the speakers say a little about the level of cooperation with other Council of Europe bodies, such as the Court of Human Rights, Commissioner for Human Rights, the Commission Against Racism and Intolerance, and the Parliamentary Assembly, and the potential to reinforce each other's work. Uh, Aoife, I think maybe that's, that one is a ball that rolls into your court, if you'd like to, to answer. Absolutely, Eleanor, thank you. And I think that's a really interesting point you said, and I just highlight, you know, what year was Albany as well as a decision? It's a very long time ago. And there's been changes in levels of acceptance, but also there's been very significant changes in the perception of the social charter, I would say generally. But I could not agree with you more that no court, whether it's the C, you know, whether it's the e, whether it's with the EU, whether it's the European Court of Human Rights, whether it's domestically, if you don't make the argument, they don't go looking for it. They're busy enough as they are. Um, so I just I would reinforce that. Um, I think very quickly, Michael, I mean, I should point out that Michael was a longtime member of ECRI where he did absolutely sterling work. So I think he knows at least part of the answer to this question. Um, it in terms of, say, the, I'm going to speak from the perspective of the European Committee of Social Rights. We have very high levels of engagement with different bodies. We have, we have the formal exchange of views where we get together and we spend a couple of hours with different bodies and we talk about our work and they talk about theirs and they're all very interesting and it's a very good expression of good faith but actually it's probably not massively substantive other than as an information sharing device and we for having done this periodically with the european court of human rights in an ad hoc way every few years we're now doing it annually 
So there's been a significant change there, which I think is also reflective of an attitudinal shift towards the charter as well. Um, and also, of course, much of the stuff is driven by personality and the last two presidents of the Court of Hum European Court of Human Rights have been very open-minded when it came to engaging with external bodies. Uh, when it comes to other, uh, other, um, other entities of the Council of Europe, I mean, the, the Parliamentary Assembly, we're frequently asked to speak at different events. We uh, are asked to submit comments on different um, recommendations, resolutions, proposals, documents. Um, when it came to the children's strategy of the Council of Europe, uh, I was asked to join a meeting of CADEMF, which is the child rights, uh, essentially go governmental sub working group that focuses on children's rights within the Council of Europe. I have a colleague that is directly working with the Lanzarote Committee, which focuses on violence against women um, and, uh, no, sorry, it doesn't. It focuses on focuses on the position uh, um, on sexual exploitation, and there's a, a colleague of mine is working around that in the context uh, of norms that they're trying to develop and standards they're trying to develop uh, as part of their work. So we engage in quite a wide range, and we're being asked to do more and more, which is wonderful, and it suggests kind of an in integrated, coherent system, right? And array for social rights. But the problem is that um, again, it comes down to time. You know, we're part time. We have full time jobs on top, top of this. And just to give an example, if you're asked to do an event, that's a day's preparation. Then there's half a day's involvement. I mean, that's very significant when you consider the amount of time that you're already spending in committee work. So I think and, and that's certainly not unique to the European Committee of Social Rights. Right. I mean, all of these bodies, with the exception of the court, most of them are, if not all of them are part time. Right. And so that is. That's something that really, I think, within the Council of Europe, challenges the ability for the system to be coherent and joined up. Um, but I would say there's good opportunities. And I'd say there's, there is, I mean, just in the four, you know, the five years I've been on the committee, there's been a real upsurge in interest. There's been a real upsurge in invitations, which is an indicator of interest, but also just, you know, the events you speak at, there's the formal engagements, and then there's the fact that, you know, you're speaking at the same events. And there is a concern I think that's felt very strongly across the Council of Europe and different different human rights bodies that there would be coherence um, and that we would engage with each other in such a way to manage that. It's a little bit different with the Parliamentary Assembly because obviously that's it's a different kind of body. It's not a human rights expert expert body in that way. So rather long winded, throwing out a few thoughts. Thank you. That was very helpful. I and uh, Olivia, do you wish to, to to add that to that at all? I was I was just as I was listening to you, the reflection was crossing my mind. Again, there's a very strong analogy in terms of who talks to whom officially, unofficially in the side, good faith, good relations, whatever. And it came to my mind that when uh, I joined the Aarhus Committee, there was a kind of very nice floating remark by the president of the core team I happened to meet after rather difficult circumstances. Uh, saying, you know, oh, you're on the Aarhus Committee now, that would be very nice. Of course, we value our relations with that committee and occasionally they come and see us. And I was thinking, I don't actually remember an occasion when the Aarhus Committee, Compliance Committee members, sat down and had a chat with the members of the Court of Justice. And I remember doing environmental law cases at the court without the benefit, just as I did social cases, right? I did the Aarhus Committee cases without anyone systematically referring me to the decisions of the Aarhus Committee Compliance Committee, which might have been deeply relevant to what we were looking at. So I think there's more than one example of non-joined up thinking here. And I'm just wondering whether in a kind of more general way, there is scope for trying to encourage and trying to encourage because it's good it's a good idea when people who have similar responsibilities talk with each other trying to encourage discussion and contact between your committee and the court between the Aarhus committee and the court would you like perhaps to comment I don't know would you like to come back on this Eva? yeah I think I mean I think there's enthusiasm for it I just I think the constraint is literally logistical and it's the fact that you know every time you do this it takes time it takes effort everyone has to be in Strasbourg everyone or online or people have to be available but what i will say is i think i think it is very valuable i think one of the challenging things is because of turnover on both the court the committee and whatever body 
it's not as if you have, it's not like a domestic court where you can have a very long term development of institutional memory. In fact, in the way you can with the, with the, you know, with CJU as well, right? It's, you know, you've relatively short terms on many of these bodies, I think particularly the court and the committee. And so part of that is that you are, you cannot, while the secretariats to both bodies have really strong institutional memory and good knowledge, individual uh, members of those bodies may not necessarily have that body. So you are sort of remake, reinventing the wheel every few years. And I mean, that's fine. I'm, I'm just flagging that is something that needs to be borne in mind when we make these plans to, you know, make the connections between the, between the bodies. Um, because I think that that's, that's something that can be borne in mind. Part of it is about developing resources in a meaningful way that mean that people, when you meet, for instance, if we meet the court or we meet another body, we're not all kind of going, here's 20 minutes and how we do such and such at a very basic level, because you have to have that level of information sharing. It means it can move straight into something more substantive. So one of the ways that that could happen is, for instance, having thematic sessions. And we had that, we uh, certainly had that in a, in a more recent meeting with the European Court, which worked very well. You know, there was a strong focus on, say, disability rights, and there was a, you know, a meaningful exchange. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's something that people are very open to. It's just about thinking about it in a, in a way that works, given the kind of modalities of the system and the issues of turnover, etc. I, th I think I think with with great respect, I think that's an extremely important point because the 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 idea that the institutional memory of the committee actually resides much more in the secretariat than it can with the committee members because of the of the terms and the turnover. That's a a, a really important practical point, and I think one has to to work with the strength of that rather than bemoan it. But it does affect the way that coordination happens. I'm looking across to the quote Q&A, and I see with pleasure another question in there, which is from Angus uh, Horgan, saying, could one of the reasons, uh, I, I'm, wait a minute, I've just been told we would like to answer this question live. Now, does that mean that somebody who's running the electronics of this is going to give the floor, is going, the, the electronic floor, to Mr. Horgan so that he can ask his question. Uh, no, just continue on as you, you will answer the question live there. Yourself. Okay. Yeah, fine. just continue on. Thank you. Fine. Uh, all right. I've been told I can go back to what I was doing before. I, I just do as I'm told. Could one of the questions, one of the reasons that the EU do not take into account the interpretation of the ESCR arise because in certain areas, EU areas, competency lies with the member states rather than with the EU. And the uh, example that's given in the, uh, in the question is e.g. social protection. Uh, Olivier, can I perhaps bat that question in your direction? Sure. Um, well, I think it is indeed one of the explanations why the European Social Charter has not been given uh, the, the standing, the status, uh, the visibility um, it, in my view, deserves in the EU law and, and policy making processes. But I think it's a wrong reason. Um, social rights, as any other human rights, uh, do not require for there to be, for, for those rights to be complied with, that the institution concerned or the actor concerned have the competences to, to fulfill the rights. Um, when the EU thought of joining um, the European Convention on Human Rights by acceding to that instrument, nobody pretended that this would be impossible because the EU does not have all the competences it requires to implement all the rights of the European Convention on Human Rights. When the Charter of Fundamental Rights was adopted in 2000 and, and then incorporated um, with the Treaty of Lisbon in the EU Treaty, no one said uh, that this is problematic because the EU has no competences in a number of areas touched by the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Rights require primarily, first and foremost, that you do not take action uh, that will impede their enjoyment by individuals. So it's primarily, rights primarily impose negative obligations that do not require 
to have competencies, right? And if I take indeed the example of social protection, um, for the most part, the states uh, rather than the EU um, are competent to develop the welfare state and, and social policies, but the EU um, may commit not to impede that action by the EU member states and to respect the social rights that um, uh, together define the adequate level of social protection. So I think um, it, is, it, is, um, it is a wrong assumption that in order to comply with the European Social Charter, you need to have all the competences required to develop them. And that point was actually developed when the Charter of Fundamental Rights was under negotiation by then Commissioner Antonio Vitorino, who was um, leading the working group of the convention for the elaboration of the Charter of Fundamental Rights um, on the question of um, um, uh, the, um, uh, the relationship to the European Convention on Human Rights. And, and it was very explicitly made uh, at that point, this, uh, this argument. Thank, thank you very much for that. I mean, I, I, th I think it, it's important that you, as you, as you have just stated, that uh, in many instances, or at least in the first instance, rights do primarily impose negative obligations. Don't get in the way of individuals enjoying the protection encompassed in that right. Sometimes they may, however, require further positive action, but usually if you look, there is in an initial, um, as it were, negative obligation, which if you, that were just to be respected would itself move things forwards in a very significant way. Uh, I have, uh, before I come back, because there's another, there's another question from Mr. Hogan, but I've also uh, got a question which has just turned up in the, in the chat uh, with the apologetic uh, uh, pre preface. Uh, saying I, I can't put this into, into the Q&A. Uh, one issue, for example, on education rights, uh, the, ca the, the case law on the right to education for children with disabilities is really important. Now, the charter says this, says this person, the charter is relatively unknown in Ireland, and uh, there's huge scope for parents of children with disabilities in Ireland to challenge systemic issues, but they don't appear to be as aware of it as they need to be. Are there, are there suggestions that you've got as to how to address this? Uh, is it about information in the, in the Irish context? Is it about, uh, I, I quote, is it about the failure to allow local NGOs to be litigants? Uh, is, there, is, there a way, is there a way forward on that? Uh, Aoife, do you want to? Sure. I think it's a really important question, Siobhan. I There's a, a range of different issues to it. I want to start with the question of what, about NGOs not being able to bring complaints. And for those who aren't familiar with the system, as I said earlier, it's a collective complaint system, right? So certain, if you were to look at the additional protocol for collective complaints, I think I can probably put it into the chat for everyone. You will see that there is a set list of people of entities that can bring complaints. So as I mentioned earlier, trade unions, international trade unions, employers organizations, international employers organizations and um, international NGOs who've consulted a status with the Council of Europe, that's article one. But very significantly, uh, you know, potentially in terms of the use of the charter, article two of the charter says that any contracting state can, when it decides to be bound by the protocol or any time afterwards, make, de make a declaration that it recognizes the right of any other representative national NGO within its jurisdiction, which has particular competence in the matters governed by the charter to make complaints against it. So basically states can say, NGOs within my member, within my you know, jurisdiction can make complaints, okay? And out of all, out of the 16 states who've ratified the collective complaints, the one country that's made that declaration out of the 16 is Finland. And interestingly, that's where you see there are domestic NGOs that bring complaints in Finland. So it definitely has an impact, right? However, I really feel that the low profile, for me, the, the 
probably the key thing that would be most important, right? Because obviously civil society is an educational role, government does, um, NHRIs do. But in fact, I just think when you have a system that is not taught to the people who are interested in human rights, who will go on and work in the area of human rights, that automatically limits very sharply the likelihood that that system's ever going to be a significant part of their work agenda as they move forward. Okay, and that's particularly so where it's in an area like social rights, where actually it's still regarded as being sort of over there, or, you know, slightly specialized or slightly left field, right? And so I do think for me, that would be the biggest thing, ensuring that it gets, that it forms parts of, rather than being regarded as hopelessly complex, which it isn't, or unimportant, which it genuinely self-evidently at this point isn't. Uh, that, they, that it's properly integrated into courses, that it's properly integrated when we talk about European human rights law as academics, we, we acknowledge that the charter system is there. So I think for me, that's the biggest thing. And in Ireland, I think it's a particular issue because not only do we not include the charter when we're talking about European human rights law, which we teach, you know, we're a very outward looking system in many ways, but we also have this historic sidelining of social rights in Irish legal education, you know, sort of a, and this is a, I'm speaking to an Irish audience here, but we know what we're talking about. I mean, we have our convert at the same time as this event is going on. We have finally an event focused on a potential housing rights amendment to the Irish Constitution. But that's against a backdrop of many, many years of Supreme Court making clear that they want nothing to do with social rights and lawyers self-censoring on that basis. And it comes back to your point about having to make the arguments, Eleanor. And part of that is to do with le legal education. And I just think it's a very important role there. For me, that would be genuinely transformative in the Irish context. And I say that as someone who thinks Irish le legal education is second to none. And I would make the same criticism in the UK and many, many other places. But it is, it's a huge limiting factor. You would be well justified in making the same criticism in the UK. And indeed, that links through very well. To, there was a comment from Michael Doherty in the, uh, in the chat that, you know, should we be doomed more to expose students to the ASC mechanism? You know, um, in labor law classes, it can make references to the charter, but, you know, should we systematically also be re making references to and explaining the European Social Charter? Ch should we, should, what about, what about the professional bodies? You know, what about the law society? What about the, what about the education what uh, to become a barrister to, to be called by kings in 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 Ireland to be called by the four ends of one of the four ends of court in the UK? I'm really searching my brain now. Have I ever heard a talk and an inn of courts, including my own beloved inn of court, Middle Temple, where somebody has said, "By the way, European Social Charter. Do you do know that's the bit that's under the Council of Europe? You know, I mean, there's people don't even get as far as saying that." I've another question now that's in the Q and A uh, from Shana Ring, uh, saying, "Has the com apart from thanking you first, as indeed I do, for two very interesting interventions, um, the question is, has the Committee of Social Rights engaged with the problem of any states' inaction, one, in respect of sexual violence generally, and two? as regards sexual harassment of students specifically. I don't know, I don't know who, uh, yeah, please, if you would. Ethan. Sorry, sorry, Olivia, I'm, I'm assuming you're happy for me to take it. So Article 710, we talk about moral and physical hazards to children and it very much includes sexual violence. And we, 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 in fact, it's an example of where we make reference to the Lanzarote Committee's work. You know, we tend to look at what states have reported to them for information on what we're looking for as well. Um, just as an information source. So we look at it there. We also look at, we've looked at domestic violence and intimate partner violence in the context of the right to social, legal and economic protection of the family under Article 16. I have never rapporteured on that and my mind is now frozen and I cannot remember if it covers sexual violence. I assume it does as an element of domestic violence, but I think we have tended to talk about the language of domestic violence um, while acknowledging obviously that sexual violence is part of that. Um, on the issue of students, no, but if you were going to talk about sexual harassment, we obviously also talk about, say, sexual harassment, specifically in the context of labour rights. Um, I think it's Article 24 of the revised charter. But you're talking, I know that you're, you know, you're talking, um, if you're talking about, and that can include obviously sexual violence that is sexually harassing. Uh, when it comes to students, however, I think if you were 
talking about, you know, if you were making an argument about a failure to engage with sexual harassment around students, where you would look at is Article E, which is our non-discrimination provision, and then Article 17.2, which focuses on the right to education. And I think if you were making an argument based on sexual violence, and you could raise the issue of, I don't know whether the status of a student is relevant, but for instance, gender, et cetera, you could probably, one could make that argument from that perspective, but it's not something we've looked at ever when we've looked at um, the right to education um, under Article 70. Uh, I'm, I'm looking back at the Q&A because I thought I had seen a second yeah. question. I, I accidentally answered it. Oh. Um, because I'm not good at the technology. So I basically had a follow-up question for Angus because Angus asked, are the bodies under the ESC trying to do too much and should it consider narrowing its focus, which might raise its profile and result in an improved focus understanding training in courts and in government administrations? But my question to Angus was, is it about the committee or is it about all of the bodies, say the committee ministers and the governmental committee? And I actually do need to know this because I'd be interested hearing it from Angus because of course he's on the governmental committee. <laughs> Well, he's just put something back in the Q and in the uh, Q and A, which says your body, Eva, and the governmental committee is what I meant. Okay, so I don't really feel <laughs> I can speak about the governmental committee with any real expertise, though I would love to hear your views, Angus. Um, I think with our body, we have a mandate. We have a, we have reporting and we have collective complaints functions. That's our top priority. On top of that, there's real enthusiasm, understandably, on the part of states that we would get involved in information sharing, education, exchange, dialogue, etc. We would love to do all those things, but I think it's we have the things we have to do, and those are really important things, and they are classic human rights promotion and protection, monitoring, promotion and protection activities, however you put it. The other stuff about, I think our challenge is not so much do we narrow which we, we literally cannot do in terms of what we're required to do in terms of the basic text. The question is whether or not it's realistic to take on a whole range of other activities that we're frequently told that would be very desirable. And I should be clear, we also think they're desirable, but again, part-time body, unpaid, limited resources, significant pressure. But I mean, Angus, you might come back in on that. I mean, you may want to speak on the, on the governmental committee side of things, which would be really interesting. Well, certainly. Angus, if you wish to do so, I would be delighted to have that contribution. I was going to, if you like, piggyback on what Aoife just said by saying that if I look at the analogy with the Aarhus Committee, uh, you know, we, we, we already have, in terms of what our mandate is and what we can deliver on, the system is groaning at the seams, you know, to be very honest. Uh, we, we, we are a part-time body, we are under-resourced, we have a dedicated hard-working secretariat, which is much too small. And when, if you look at looking at the incoming flow of uh, communications, what is in the pending file, and then all the follow-up is where the meeting of the parties have uh, endorsed something we've said and said, please would, you know, please state party, would you try and sort this out? We just look at it and we think, well, you know, we, we know we've got to get on with all of it and it's prioritizing one bit rather than another. The trouble is it is all part of our mandate, you know, and you're not really meant to prioritize a bit of the mandate over another bit. But it may be that within your story, I don't know, uh, Angus, if you if you want to come back on that, if you've something to add on that, uh, I would be delighted to, to hear it, uh, assuming that assuming the gods of technology are with us. Um, can I, can I, am I, can I am allowed to ask you to unmute and will something happen if I do? I don't think you can. I think no. that that's, it's, it's part of the process. So maybe Angus could follow up in the Q&A or something. That might be the way. There is another question. Alan. There is. Right. Uh, if you could maybe follow up in the, in the, in the Q&A, that would be, that would be very good. Uh, uh, and I also have a question in the chat. Oh, so I take them. I'm going to take the one that's in the Q&A and then, then the one in the chat. Uh, in the Q&A, both speakers noted how in various ways the ECSR is a poor relation of the European Court of Human Rights. To what extent do our speakers think that status has affected the jurisprudence of the ECSR, either allowing it to be more radical because it can politically fly under the radar or less radical because committee, the committee has incentives to try to make itself more attractive to member states or EU institutions, or et cetera, 
or to appeal to any other constituency, or in other ways, or none. I'm tempted to say, do not write on both sides of the paper at once when attempting to answer that question. But I don't know. Perhaps, I don't know if Olivia would like to go first on that one, since uh, it seems a good distribution. For the, first to you, and then secondly to Eva, please. Thank you, Eleanor. I, 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 I had a connection problem and did not hear the question, but I do read the question, if that's the one from Claire Lugar. Is that the question? Uh, no, no. Um, right. It's in su subtle. Both, uh, I'm, I, it's not in the chat, it's in the Q&A. All right. It's in the Q&A, it's, it's the last question in the Q&A. No, well, I, 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 I would perhaps uh, then react to that question by, by saying that uh, um, there, was, there, there were some instances where the um, European Committee of Social Rights um, went quite um, far in its interpretation of the European Social Charter and um, may have, on, in those instances, um, um, alienated certain states. Uh, let me be very, very candid here. And I think um, in the context of the European Social Charter, in which we need more buy-in from states, both to expand the, the, the number of ratifications of the um, protocol on collective complaints and to encourage states to lengthen the list of um, provisions they uh, accept. Um, we need to move um, in, in a, in, at a speed that will, that will not lose states on the way. And I think um, the area of social rights is one that is still uh, contentious, uh, sadly. Um, but um, but that requires um, um, to to proceed with 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 great caution. Now, in those particular instances, I am thinking of um, the position of the European Committee of Social Rights was really to read the European Social Charter in the light of general international human rights law. Um, sometimes setting aside the textual um, interpretation of the European Social Charter in, in instead favoring an interpretation that would be aligning the European Social Charter with other human rights instruments. That is a, a legitimate way of interpreting human rights law in a context in which increasingly human rights law is proceeding as a sort of um, jus commune, common law of human rights under development in which, you know, uh, each instrument is read in the light of other existing instruments in the human rights landscape. Um, but it has, um, it has uh, created some, some tensions. Um, I think here it's important um, to recall that the state's parties to the European Social Charter, although they may legitimately disagree with, you know, uh, this decision on disability rights or that decision on the rights of uh, undocumented migrants, etc. They should not um, neglect that the European rule of law is an extremely important value to, to preserve. And by European rule of law, I mean um, complying with decisions even though one particular decision uh, you may not agree with, um, for the sake of the system uh, being preserved in its integrity. And if one state disagrees with one decision addressed to it, um, it should nevertheless comply because that will allow that state to then finger point at other states for them not complying within the um, uh, supervision of the um, uh, instrument within the Committee of Ministers. So I think that is what I wanted to say. Um, even though some decisions may seem far reaching, they can be explained by this willingness to develop this or contribute to the development of this common law of human rights. And it's extremely important not to lose sight of the end objective, which is to ensure um, that um, on the European continent, we, we, we protect human rights in a way that is consistent with the rule of law, which, is def which means deferring to the 
independent assessment by experts whose task it is to provide this authoritative interpretation. That's uh, all for me. Thank you on that, that question. That has always been a very strong argument I know that's made in the context of the European Court of Human Rights, that it's very important that when there is a judgment against one of the older democracies, think France, Germany, UK, there aren't that many of these cases, but it's really important that those countries do comply with the case law, because otherwise a very bad example is set in terms of the rule of law to, to other perhaps newer democracies who are also state signatory. Aoife, did you want to add to that? Um, I think it's an interesting question. Um, I think, you know, the idea of whether one person's radical decision that is problematic and alienating for another person is a decision that's fundamental when it comes to ensuring protection of the social rights of some of the most so socially vulnerable groups in, in Europe. Uh, and I say that I wasn't on the committee at the time of either of the, uh, particularly the migrant children decision, which was very uh, very controversial led to huge pushback from states um, interestingly states that now no longer push back and are much more conciliatory about it but time passes and what is once radical then becomes part of the jurisprudence right um, or accepted part of the jurisprudence and I think it's um, I, I mean I, I think it's very hard to say I think it depends on the on the makeup I think it depends on the time I think it depends on the issue um, I think that there is a really delicate balance for anybody, whether it be the committee or otherwise, about um, I, no one ever, I don't think it's, there's ever been a situation where the committee has chosen to pursue a radical agenda for the sake of being radical in the sense of, you know, being an act, in the same way courts aren't activists for the sake of being activists generally, it's because they're, they see an issue and they want to deal with it in a particular way. I think the interesting thing, one of the interesting parts of your question but the fact that their decisions have been taken as radical is reflects you know prevailing European attitudes, particularly for instance on the part of committee of ministers representatives rather than um, any effort on the part of the committee to be characterized as such. Uh, I think that question about whether it's because it's less well known than the ECHR, I don't know because I think that would suggest that I mean, I think it is. There's no question it is less well known. And it is obviously something the committee is aware of. But it's own, I mean, there are multiple factors. Sorry, I'm looking at Ushin because he's in the room with me. There's multiple factors that, you know, affect how you engage with an issue, including, frankly, the approach of, you know, other international bodies, etc. So I would say maybe, you know, at different times, it'll be a, be a factor, but it certainly isn't about where, you know, we, we get less attention. And I know you're not suggesting this, actually, it has never been a case of we get less attention than the ECHR, let's make them look at us, because there is a real awareness on the part of the committee of the huge political danger of that, because at the end of the day, you know, and I was, this was before I was on the committee, so I can speak to this because it in no way impacts on my current involvement. But for instance, after the migrant children decision, there was real pressure on the part of some member states, the committee of ministers to come out and say the, committee, the European Committee of Social Rights couldn't reach that decision. We must tell them they cannot do that again. And then the response was exactly this point of, well, you don't like this decision, but this is the job of the committee. So, and ultimately that was what prevailed. But I think, you know, we are a body that is very aware of political pressure prob and probably you know we're aware of political pressures but you know one does one's work in the same way UN treaty bodies are aware in the same way that different courts are right um, and you do your best in that context uh, I'm I'm in a difficulty I I see I, I see on my screen that uh, Angus Hogan put his hand up but I have no idea how to give him a live microphone and I also have a very uh, interesting, at least I think very interesting question in the chat, uh, which uh, has, says it's a question to all three of us. So perhaps I, I can and should take that one now. To all three of us, given our respective backgrounds, what do you believe is the one key argument that is likely to convince most state officials to accept the idea of an EU accession to the European Social Charter. <coughs> I, I think since I've put the two panelists in Tibet systematically answering other questions, maybe I, maybe I pick up this particular hot potato first. And uh, I'm going to answer a bit from the perspective, obviously I'm no longer a serving member of the court, but I was at the court when opinion 213 got produced. And I remember that the European Court of Human Rights was barely on speaking terms with us 
for about 18 months after that came out. I think that something that is important or is likely to be important is we all saw opinion two of 13, whether we liked it or not, whether we thought it was right or not, whether we thought it was the court having a hizzy fit or not. We all saw that that's what the court did. And since then, I haven't kept abreast of what's been happening with the discussion on EU accession to the ECHR, which is, of course, actually a treaty commitment in Article 6 to EU. But at the same time, there is the article from memory, Article 8 of the, uh, is in the protocol number 8, saying that it has to be done in a way that works within EU law. And it was the tension between those two that enabled the court to write what it did in opinion two of 13. I, if I were a state official, I would be wanting people to explain to me in a nice and convincing way how if I were to start to support the idea of the EU signing up to the European Social Charter, this could be done without running into the kind of difficulties and the kind of hurdles that the court identified in the in opinion two of 13. There's a bit of discussion of that in Olivier's report, uh, but I think, I mean, and he mentioned at the end of this intervention, and my, my thought to myself was, this is a whole big topic for at least two days worth of separate discussion, because I don't think that one should assume because there were problems and opinion two of 13, that it's a non-starter to get EU accession to the European Social Charter. I'm not that negative about it. But I think that one would have to think very slowly and carefully and painstakingly about the various problems identified in opinion two of 13. And it really is a kind of rather long shopping list of well, we don't like this and we don't like that and we don't like the other which may have had something to do with the fact it was, a, it was an assemblée plénière decision and everyone put their bit into it. Uh, but I think people would need to be, if they want to be encouraged to pick this up as an initiative and move forward with it, they would need to feel more comfortable about we won't get into the same situation again with the court because the court would be asked, I think, almost inevitably, to produce an advisory opinion, just as it was for ECHR accession, I would foresee that if accession to the European Social Charter were mooted and there was a draft agreement, someone would refer that to the court and ask for an advisory opinion. And you'd want to feel more comfortable that if that were all to happen, that the kind of difficulties that had arisen in the past weren't going to be invoked this time around and that the outcome would be a positive outcome that's perhaps a slightly it's i hope it's actually realistic rather than cynical but certainly that would be my single take on the single one key thing that needed to happen in order to advance this uh can i hand over perhaps to Aoife would you like to to take on or, or Olivier first, Olivier first, please, Olivier. Thank you. Well, first of all, to build on Eleanor, your very useful remarks, I think apart from the, um, I think problems resulting from the way the protocol for the accession of the EU to the ECHR was drafted, I think there were technical mistakes that could have been much, I mean, easily avoided, frankly, by the negotiators. There was one key issue that led the court to deliver its opinion um, to 13, and that is um, the, the, the risk that um, um, states would not be allowed to cooperate with one another in, on the basis of mutual recognition and mutual trust in the building of the area of freedom, security, and justice. Now, in fact, the court was proposing uh, quid pro quo to the member states saying, look, if you want accession, you have to have a disconnection clause 
allowing that mutual recognition um, to be allowed, mutual trust to be blind between states um, as a price to pay for accession to the ECHR. That is my reading of the opinion. Now, that issue does not arise for the European Social Charter. There is no such a problem as the, the one that was at the heart of opinion 213. Now, this being said, it's not the, 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 the key question that Claire asks is what can positively be presented as an argument for accession. My answer is um, it's a way to encourage um, the, the, the gradual transformation of the EU into a federal state. I mean, this is, um, of course, the elephant in the room. If we want the EU to gradually um, pursue its integration, there are two ways of doing this. Either you develop secondary legislation and you harmonize further areas uh, in which the EU has competences, or you ensure that the um, um, international commitments of the EU will be um, further strengthened so as to avoid that in areas um, that uh, in which member states have to implement EU law, there are variable levels of commitment, right? And, and I think um, just like the, the Court of Justice was concerned that accession to the ECHR would um, make it more difficult to pursue that integration based on mutual trust. Here, um, it's exactly the opposite. It actually will facilitate uh, uniform application of EU law and avoid any risk of social dumping within the EU. So that would be my, my answer. Um, complex, we would need two days to discuss this in, 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 in depth. It would be a very interesting two days. I wish I could agree with you. I wish I could agree with you that the, the heart and the only issue of opinion 213 was the issue of mutual trust and not the trust. only, but the heart. Well, no, you. but I, unfortunately, I think, unfortunately, I think there are significant other issues wrapped up in that opinion. It may be that the court, the court has moved on a bit since then, maybe. And it may be that some of the uh, concerns that found their way into opinion 213 uh, might not be such strong points now. But uh, I do, of course, take your point that uh, here the, the mutual trust and blind trust point is not is, that that isn't a problem. Right? That, that, I, that, I, that I take. Aoife, would you like to chip in on this one? Uncharacteristically. I have nothing to say. <laughs> and also part of it is that I don't think I really should be speaking about uh, accession to the social charter, I think possibly as a committee member. And I think Olivier answered it brilliantly. And Eleanor, you have your own insights, so I'll leave it there. Well, since I, since I was never a judge, I'm happy to tell you I can't breach the secret du délibéré because I wasn't in the délibéré. So I merely looked in a rather appalled way at the result and thought, ah, we need to try again. Uh, now, we are absolutely, I think, on time of uh, terms of when this uh, webinar is meant to be ending. And I say that with real regret because this is, I mean, I have learned a great deal from it. It's been a very interesting and a very fun webinar to chair. And I hope that those listening to us have, have also found it a very, a very interesting and a very rich and, and fruitful a uh, couple of hours. Uh, I'd like to ask the people who are responsible for the technology, if it's at all possible, I would like to stay online and just talk briefly with my two panelists and the organizers after, after this. Uh, but may I really thank uh, both Aoife and Olivier uh, for, their, for their contributions and their, their openness. And can I please also thank the organizers Siobhan and Michael for the work that went in to getting this, this event to happen. So thank you, thank you very much indeed.